This lecture is part of an online course on Lie groups and will be about Engels theorem. So Engels theorem will help to explain the following mystery. Why is a nilpotent group called nilpotent? So if you recall a nilpotent group G0 is one such that if you kill off the center and get a new group G1 and then kill off the center of that and get a new group G2 and continue like this, we eventually get to the, 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 the trivial group. Um, on the other hand, the word nilpotent, well, nilpotent means zero and potent means power. So something should be nilpotent if some power of it is equal to zero. And at first sight, the, 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 this concept of nilpotent seems to have very little to do with the definition of nilpotent for a, for a group. Um, and the explanation of it goes via Lie algebras. So we say Lie algebra L0 is nilpotent. If when you keep killing off the center of L0 to get L1, then you kill off the center of L1 to get L2 and so on. A Lie algebra is called nilpotent if that eventually ends up as the zero Lie algebra. Um, well, again, um, that the definition of nilpotent for groups is obviously defined by analogy with the definition of nilpotent for Lie algebras. Um, well, at first sight, the definition of nilpotent for Lie algebras doesn't seem to have much to do with nilpotents either. Um, so um, th 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 this difference is explained by Engels' theorem. So Engels' theorem says the following. Suppose we have a Lie algebra contained in the Lie algebra of n by n matrices. And so L is going to be a Lie algebra. Um, then, if all elements of L are nilpotent, um, L fixes some non-zero vector v um, of r to the n. This is assuming n is greater than zero, of course. Um, well, I first I'd better say what we mean by fixing a vector. So um, if, if g is a group, then we say that a group element would fix a vector if g of v is equal to v. This is not the definition we use for Lie algebras. For Lie algebras, um, the definition of fixing a vector says that L of v is equal to zero, where L is in the Lie algebra. The reason for this is that we think of an element of a Lie algebra as being a sort of difference between um, an element of the group and the identity. So we might think of G as being approximately the identity element plus an element of the Lie algebra. So, so this is why we, the definition of a Lie algebra element fixing a vector is given like that. Um, well, this still doesn't seem to have much to do with nilpotent matrices, but now we observe that we can we can repeat this to, with, with r to the n modulo v. Let's call this v zero, or oh, sorry, let's call it v one, and we can find a vector v two in r to the n over v one, which is fixed by by the Lie algebra L. And we can continue like this. We get v1, v2, and so on, up to vn. And if we use these vectors as a basis for r to the n, then, um, then all elements of L are strictly upper triangular. So um, L is now contained in the subspace of these matrices. And the set of these strictly upper triangular matrices Um, it's formerly algebra, and on the one hand the elements are obviously nilpotent, and on the other hand they satisfy the definition of nil, being nilpotent Lie algebra that I mentioned earlier. Um, for example, if we take um, four-dimensional space and look at this Lie algebra, we can see the center of it is more or less these matrices here. If we quotient out by those, then the center of the resulting algebra is given by matrices where these are allowed to be non-zero. And if we quotient out by the center of that, then we quotient out everything and we get zero. 
So Engel's theorem shows that the condition for being a nil potent Lie algebra is closely related to the condition that all matrices of the Lie algebra are nil potent. Uh, I should have a sort of warning that uh, a Lie algebra L inside the n by n matrices can be nil potent as a Lie algebra but not nil potent as matrices. For example, we just take um, GL1 of R and we just take the matrix 1 in GL1 of R. Well, this is obviously, this is obviously a nil potent Lie algebra because it's abelian. On the other hand, this is obviously not a nil potent matrix. So the connection between nil potent Lie algebras and nil potent matrices isn't quite as clean as you would really like. Um, so um, let's sketch the idea of the proof. This is a proof of Engel, Engel's theorem. Um, the main idea is we repeatedly use induction on the dimension of the Lie algebra and the dimension of um, the vector space r to the n that, that is acting on. So, so we can sort of assume if we've got any smaller Lie algebra or any smaller space, then we can apply Engel's theorem to that. Um, so the, the, the proof really involves three steps. So step one is that L acts on itself by um, nil potent operators. Well, what do we mean by L acting on itself? Well, any Lie algebra L acts on itself um, because if you've got an element L of the Lie algebra, it acts as the map from L to L, taking M to um, the bracket of L and M. So we can think of L as being a sub, uh, as mapping to the a Lie algebra of linear maps from L to itself. This isn't necessarily injective because L might have a center, in other words, something that commutes with everything. Um, and what we want to do is to show the action of L on L, these things are all nil potent. So, so we want to know are these nil potent? Well, um, we think of this as taking M to L of M minus m of l, where we're now thinking of these as matrices. And we notice that m goes to l times m is nil potent, because we assumed all the elements of l were nil potent as matrices. And similarly, l goes to m times l is also nil potent. And we notice that these two commute as linear transformations, because right multiplication commutes with left multiplication. And now, if we've got two commuting nil potent um, objects, so, so, so if x and y are two commuting nil potent things, then um, x plus y is nil potent. And the reason for this is that if we write, if, if x to the n is equal to zero and y to the n is equal to zero, then we notice that x plus y to the two n equals zero because if you expand this by the binomial theorem, every term involves either x to the n or y to the n. So um, the adjoint action of L on itself, which is this, also acts by nil potent matrices. Um, so the second step of the proof is that L contains an ideal of co-dimension one. So we just recall what an ideal is. Um, an ideal of a Lie algebra is something just such, such the bracket of anything in L and M is contained in, in M. So this is the analog for Lie algebras of a normal subgroup of groups. You can easily check that if we've got an ideal of a Lie algebra, then we can take a quotient and that still has a Lie algebra structure. And this is easy, we just pick M to be a maximal subalgebra 
that's not equal to L, assuming L has dimension greater than zero. Um, and now we're going to look at M acting on the space L modulo M. So here we've got a Lie algebra acting on a vector space, which is just the vector space quotient of L by M. And now we're going to apply induction. And by the induction hypothesis, since M has lower dimension than L, and we've just seen it acts by nilpotent matrices on this, we see that there's a vector V in L over M with V not equal to zero, and V is fixed by, um, by M. Well, this means that, um, that, 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 that um, if we take um, RV and add it to M, this is also a subalgebra. So by maximality of M, um, it's uh, equal to L. So M has co-dimension 1 in L, and you can also see that VM is contained in M because M acts act trivially on V modulo M, so M is an ideal. So, um, so this is step two. We've shown that L always contains an ideal of co-dimension one, assuming L is non-zero. And now the third step is very easy. Um, so step three, we've got L contains an M. M is an ideal of co-dimension equal to one. And now these both act on our vector space V. And, and let's put um, V0 equals vectors fixed by M. And by induction, um, V0 is not um, just zero because M has to fix some vectors um, on V because M has smaller dimension than L. And now L is generated by X and M. So, so now let X act on V0. Well, this acts nilpotently. This is where we finally use the condition that the matrices of L all act nilpotently. So fixes a non-zero vector of V0, because any nilpotent um, endomorphism of a, of a non-zero vector space must, must um, have a vector that it kills or, or fixes if we're talking about Lie algebras. Um, and this proves the theorem. So V0 is fixed by the Lie algebra L, which is what we wanted to prove. Um, so that proves Engel's theorem. Um, there's a sort of analogue of this theorem due to Kolschin for groups. It says that um, if G is an algebraic group contained in the general linear group over a field, an algebraic group just means it's a group that can be defined by um, polynomial equations, um, then he says if G is unipotent, then, then um, G is conjugate to a subgroup of the group with ones down the diagonal and zeros here and something there. Um, so what does unipotent mean? Well, unipotent means all eigenvalues are equal to one. Um, so nilpotent means all eigenvalues are equal to zero. So this is a sort of group theoretic analog of a matrix being nilpotent. Um, if a matrix is nilpotent, then one plus that matrix is unipotent. And this is obviously very similar to the condition that the Lie algebra should be conjugate to something that is strictly upper triangular. Um, um, in some of the lectures, I've made several rather disparaging remarks about nilpotent Lie algebras and nilpotent groups and said how horrible they were. And 
I would like to point out that although they're kind of evil, they're not completely evil. And there is actually one nice property of nilpotent Lie algebras that doesn't hold for general Lie algebras. So suppose we have a Lie algebra L contained in a group of strictly upper triangular matrices. So, so in particular, L is nilpotent as a Lie algebra. Then the exponential map is an isomorphism from um, L to the corresponding Lie group. Well, what is the corresponding Lie group? Well, if we like, we can even define it to be the set of exponentials of matrices of L. I should say here we're working over the reals, or more generally a field of characteristic zero, because otherwise you can't define the exponential map. And this is very easy to see because, in fact, the series for x is finite. In fact, you can see for any matrix in L, a to the n is equal to zero for, um, for some fixed n. So the exponential of a is just equal to 1 plus a plus a squared over 2 plus a to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. And it's just a polynomial in a. And similarly, log of 1 plus a is equal to a minus a squared over 2 plus a cubed over 3 plus or minus all the way up to plus or minus a to the n minus 1 over n minus 1. So the series for log of x and exponential of x now converge everywhere as long as you're just working with upper triangular matrices. Um, so um, in, in particular, you can see that the set of matrices of the form um, x of a for A in the Lie algebra is the simply connected Lie group. And it's simply connected because it's isomorphic as a, as a topological space to L, which is just a vector space, which is obviously simply connected. So, um, so the, the, the correspondence between simply connected Lie groups and Lie algebras is particularly easy because the exponential and logarithm map always converge. Um, now let's have an example of a nilpotent Lie group that is not um, simply connected and is not a matrix group meaning we can't identify it as finite matrices uh, uh, over the reals, although we can identify it as an infinite matrix group. And for this, we just take G to be the group of all these matrices. So this is a nilpotent Lie group of dimension three, and we quotient out by the set of matrices of the form of this form where n is in z. So this is in the centre of the group G, so we're just quoting out by a, by a subgroup in the centre isomorphic to z. So this is the famous Heisenberg group, which appears a lot in quantum mechanics because it controls um, the position and momentum operators of a, of a boson. Um, and let's look at the Lie algebra. Well, the Lie algebra is spanned by three elements. Let's take x to be um, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and y to be this matrix with a 1 there, and z to be the last one, which is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And now we can work out the brackets between x, y, and z, and we find that the bracket of x and y is z or possibly minus z, I sometimes get this wrong, and, and z bracketed with x and z bracketed with y is just zero. So z is the center or spans the center of this Lie algebra. And now we want to show that we can't represent g in terms of finite matrices. Well, we look at uh, the image of z. Here we're taking a map from G to the
the general linear group over n of the reals and the Lie algebra will, will, be, uh, will map to something in the n by n matrices over the reals and we want to look at the image of z in n by n matrices over the reals. And now we notice that x of um, iz, uh, sorry, x of z um, must be equal to 1. Uh, sorry, we should be working over the complex numbers, not the reals, so that I can diagonalize everything. Um, we know that x of z is equal to 1, and this implies that z is diagonalizable. Because if a matrix isn't diagonalizable and you push into Jordan, norm, Jordan form, you see that the x, x of it can't be 1, um, and we just get a one parameter subgroup isomorphic to the real. So we know z is diagonalizable. On the other hand, z is in the center of, of the um, group or Lie algebra G. Um, so we can pick some eigenspace v of z in c to the n. And we notice that v is acted on by g because z is in the center of the Lie algebra. So all eigenspaces are also preserved by g. So um, um, the z looks like, well, it has to be diagonal um, and it's got only one eigenvalue on v, so it must look like this in v for some a in, in c. And now we use the Lie brackets. We know that xy is equal to z, so trace of xy is equal to the trace of z. Well, this is just the trace of xy minus the trace of yx, which is equal to zero, because you know for matrices, the trace of a product of two matrices doesn't depend on the order of the product. Um, so um, the trace of z must be zero, but the trace of z is just equal to the dimension of v times a. So a equals naught as the characteristic is equal to zero. Um, so z acts trivially on any eigenspace. So the action of z is trivial on v. So um, the, the, the map from g, from g to um, GLN over C is trivial on um, X of Z, which is the set of um, group elements of this form. So there's no faithful finite dimensional representation um, of this group G. Um, I'll just finish by um, mentioning the fact that here I sort of emphasized we were in characteristic zero. Um, so in characteristic zero, if you've got matrices x, y, such that x, y minus y, x is equal to the identity matrix, this implies um, 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 if, if we're in characteristic zero, the matrices must be zero dimensional. So this is really not possible in characteristic equal to zero. I just point out that the, 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 the condition that characteristic zero is the characteristic of zero is actually essential because um, in characteristic p greater than zero, we can take x to be d by dx and y to be multiplication by x on the space v, which is spanned by 1x x squared up to x to the p um, um, up to x to the p minus 1. Um, we notice that d by dx to the power of p is equal to zero, so this is why um, we can do this in characteristic p, but not characteristic zero. Um, okay, that will be all for the about nilpotent Lie algebras for the moment.